And people usually just get together in church and they start talking about all the promises that's going to be coming your way in the next year. You know, God has showed me there's going to be blessings pouring out of heaven. The wonders of heaven will be open. It's going to be a, a season of whatever they come up with. They call it a season of, of prosperity, a season of uh, of, uh, of higher heights or, or too blessed to be stressed in, in, in 2015. Or You know, it just goes on and on with all this stuff and hoopla and cheerleaders and clowns and balloons and smoke and mirrors and all this stuff. And at the end of the day... You got the same old thing, and you come back down from that rah-rah session on New Year's Eve, and you go to work on Monday, and it's the same old thing again. And uh, at some point, you, you can't keep doing this. I mean, just pretending like something is happening that's not happening. And going through all of these different, all these different um, uh, pep rallies, I call them, to get you pepped up. And prepared to go out there and face life again. You know, a pet rally is designed to get the team and the cheerleaders and the faculty and the, and the student body worked up before the big homecoming game. But after the game is over and you lose 52 to nothing, now what? That was pretty, that was pretty useless to get all pepped up in the pet rally and you got a sorry team. How many people went to school where there were sorry teams going to pet rallies every Friday? And the team got beat to death on Friday night or Saturday afternoon. See, pet rallies will not sustain it. You got to have something more lasting than a pet rally. And the only thing that you can have that's going to have any substance and lasting durability is a deep relationship with Jesus Christ. So we're going to deal tonight with uh, this, these two diametrically opposing things that operate down here. As far as um, as far as really getting to know God, you know, it's a lot of uh, stuff that goes on in in church entity, but very little substance is realized. You know, you just got a lot of a lot of activity with no progression. It's like being in your car in a field of mud, and you just got the accelerator pushed to the floor, engine the RPM to run at 110 RPMs. Engine is roaring. You got the accelerator to the floor. You're just staring the steering wheel and turning it left and right, and the car is sitting still. What's wrong? You're stuck in the mud. You got all this activity, all this wear and tear on your engine, all this stuff going on, but no progression. You're not moving. And that's what you got in church for the most part a lot of stuff going on with no progression. So it's time to break out of this wilderness. You know, the wilderness is the same thing. When you're walking through the wilderness with the Israelites, you got a lot of activity, but no progression. They were circling. And you know, if you, if you circle wide enough, you can't tell you're circling. You know, if you take a long, broad expanse and just circle over, let's say, 50 or 60 miles, and you just walk in a circle, you'll never know you're circling. Because it won't appear to be a circle. You look like you're walking straight. So that's what they did. He circled them in the wilderness until the flesh died. And the flesh, as far as the Israelites were concerned, coming out of Egypt, were the old folks that came out of Egypt. That was the flesh. They came from Egypt with all of that Egyptian idolatry in their souls. And they were not able to take the promised land because they couldn't let go of the flesh. The flesh is always the problem. If you don't see progression in the body of Christ, if you see something bogged down and limitations and God not appearing to do anything, start looking for the flesh. It's going to be there. It's going to be the flesh every time. And it's going to be there in the forefront. And what our problem is in the 21st century is religious flesh. It's religious flesh. And without, without God taking us through a process of crucifixion, that religious flesh will act like it knows God until the cows come home and we'll never have anything done. That's why you got to back all the way out. Now, here's the, the normal thing that people do when they come to the Lord. You're in the world. You go through hell. You realize this is getting you nowhere. 
you tell yourself, I'm going to church. I'm going back to church. I was brought up in the church. My mom and my daddy raised me in the church. I need to go back to church. So the first step you take on your way to being saved is going to church. Now, you didn't get saved. You went to church. So that did nothing for you, basically. You became a sinner, twerk dancing in the club, and now you became a sinner with your hands raised crying in the church, but you didn't get saved. You just changed atmospheres. You came out of the club into the church, but it did nothing for you as far as being born again. That's the vast majority of people you talk to concerning Jesus Christ. They haven't been born again. They left the club and came to the church. It did nothing for them whatsoever. Nothing. So the vast majority of people in church have not been saved. You just go to church. They're at watch night tonight, going through all those histrionics, being duped by a false prophet because they haven't been born again. So you can't see, neither can you enter into the kingdom of God unless you've been born again, according to Jesus. You got to be born again. John chapter 3, Gospel of John chapter 3. Unless you're born again, you cannot enter in, neither can you even see the kingdom of God. You can't even see the kingdom to come to it. Because you haven't been born again. You hear somebody preaching the kingdom and you can't receive it because you haven't been born again. See, this thing is not rocket science. It's, it's absolutely um, understandable if you just look at the people and the circumstances around us. You try to figure out why you go to a church person that same, claims to know Christ. You present them with factual truth and they don't like you. It's because they haven't been born again. So first of all, the, the real Christian has to be delivered from trying to make everybody a Christian and trying to, you know, amalgamate into that church entity and make it real and make it something that pertains to Christ when it doesn't. So that's that dichotomy we have, church folk and people that have been born again. You got to realize that. That's why we say no more pet rallies. Pet rallies are for church folk. They got to get worked up into a frenzy every once in a while just to feel like I'm in this thing. It peps you up. It's a motivational exercise. And these guys who run these churches, they know that. They know the people need stimulation. You know, without being born again, you have a continuous need for entertainment. You got to be entertained, worked up, pepped up. You got to go through sequences of, um, you know, carnivals and fish fries and cookouts and complications and revivals and tent revivals and and all this stuff because you got to be entertained because you haven't been born again when you've been born again you have a dynamo in your spirit that drives you you don't need a lot of external things because the internal dynamo will drive you now you do have to keep the dynamo empowered that's what prayer and fasting is all about to keep the dynamo turned on see what we do we power down because we stop fasting and praying we stop seeking the lord we stop doing what i call the mechanics of salvation to keep the dynamo running heavy i don't care how much you you uh try to drive your car try to drive it without gas in it try to start it without a battery you're gonna forget it drive it without an alternator and see if your battery will remain charged It'll run for a while, but when that battery runs out and that alternator's not charging it up, you're going to have a, a pile of junk you just sitting in no matter what you pay for it because it's got no power. The church, void of power, is just a useless, empty wasteland. It benefits no one. And for the most part, that's what we have. Hundreds, thousands of buildings everywhere. Any given city, a major metropolitan area, could have thousands of churches in it. And it has no appreciable uh, benefit to the surroundings whatsoever. That's impossible. How can you set God down in the middle of an environment in a community and, it has no, and he has no benefit to the community whatsoever? No appreciable difference, no appreciable change. It's just the same old thing. So my thing is, no pep rallies, not trying to work folks up, but a realistic look at what's really going on. And that's what it's all about. 
So we're going to take a look at this thing and what is diametrically opposed to pet rallies. What word the Bible uses over and over again to instruct us to keep us free from this uh, pseudo religious environment, this uh, this make believe uh, matrix is what I call it of religion so that we can in a real formatted way, a disciplined way, engage an enemy, the devil and destroy him. One thing I'll say in this introduction, last thing I'll say is this. <clears throat> I found that those that want to fight a war against the devil, they are a different kind of people in the church. As opposed to folks that just want to go to church and be involved and sit in pews. The warlike people are a different breed. And the, the problem with church people is this. Church people love to think in extremes. What do I mean by that? Church people think in either or formats. It's got to be either this or that. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thesis. There's an antithesis. But there's never, never a synthesis. It's either this or that. That, that, that. If you think like that, you'll never walk with God. Because the worst thing you'll do is come up with paradigms that are cookie cutter to deal with people's problems. I had a conversation with a lady yesterday, and she's a good, good sister. I, I don't have any, any problem with her, but we were dealing with divorce and remarriage. And, you know, most people look at divorce and remarriage in a um, stone-cast concrete fashion, and they think that I look at it sometimes in a cavalier fashion. Because you said I said something in the message, uh, man of God, about divorce that was kind of off the cuff, like I didn't take it seriously. But the fact of the matter is, nobody, nobody on this planet can give you concrete, absolute directions on what, what to do about divorce and remarriage. Nobody. Why is that? Now, this is an example I use with her. People go to the scriptures with, except for the cause of fornication or adultery or sexual sin, you can't be divorced. All right. You got a person sitting there. I've, I've, I've been here and done this, so I know what I'm talking about. I've been around doing this for 31 years. I didn't just start doing it last week. And I don't say that proudly or arrogantly trying to make myself somebody, but experience can teach you something. I mean, unless you're some kind of a knucklehead, you know. So anyway, if you got a person sitting across from you and you believe in your mind that the only reason they can be divorced is sexual sin, adultery, or fornication, lady comes to you, she says, I need help, I need counseling, I, 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 I'm considering getting a divorce or I've been divorced. And the problem was nothing but continual, continual beatings and all kinds of verbal abuse and physical abuse the beating of my children brutal beatings of me i've been i've had my leg broken my arm broken uh my son has lost an eye from a beating he he took from my husband my husband has never committed adultery or fornication but we're getting beat to death in the house and you tell them the lord says Except for fornication or adultery, you must stay with him. A week later, the news reports revealed that the woman has been murdered. She had her skull crushed by a bowling ball that her husband beat her to death with. That woman's blood is on your hands. You see, when you think in concrete and, and cookie cutter advice from the letter without the spirit, You'll get somebody killed in this. People live in traumatic, dysfunctional, stratified conditions that only God can give answers to. Well, if you get divorced, you can't remarry. You better let God talk to you about what you can or cannot do. Because I know, I know people have been, been divorced and remarried that are powerhouses doing the work for the Lord. So you, 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 you got to get away from people who only read the letter, void of the spirit. And that's what we're going to, I'm going to deal with that in a minute about 
the people who deal with the letter versus the spirit because people who deal with the letter don't have an open doorway to God's mind to tell you anything. They're telling you things from the Bible. But everything from the Bible is not applicable to you because he wasn't talking to you. You got to know that. If he's talking to Peter, you can't take what God told Peter and make it apply to you. Unless the Holy Ghost takes it up for you in your particular instance and tells it to you. God is not the God of the dead. He's what? He's the God of the living. We're in a living relationship with God on a daily basis. So you can't take what the Bible calls dead letter. The letter killeth, but the spirit brings the letter alive. What I just said, a religious mind cannot process what I just said. They can't even hear what I just said. It, it will make no sense to them. They'll go right back to the Bible, beating people to death with the letter, having no access to the spirit. So you got to understand authority. <clears throat> if Omar, let's a, this say a right now Omar is called to be an apostle like Peter or called to be a pastor like Timothy. Now, if you read instructions given to Timothy or Peter in the Bible, it might not be applicable to Omar. God's going to talk to Omar about what Omar has to do in the 21st century. He'll use the Bible to prepare him, but then he wants to talk to him himself because there's things that he wants him to do that are not germane to the Bible. There is no Philadelphia or New York or Los Angeles in the Bible. There are no trains, no planes, no computers, no cell phones. Some of the things that people have discovered through physics and, and experimentation and all kinds of, uh, of, 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 of scientific discoveries are not in the Bible because they didn't exist then. You see, God is not shocked by any of this because he knew about, it, about all of it before Alexander Graham Bell discovered the phone or whatever. God knew about the phone. He just didn't tell you and me. He knew about jet engines. He knew about uh, the ability to fly. Long before the, the Wright brothers or whoever that was in North Carolina, North Carolina discovered flight. See, it's not some kind of a shocking revelation to God, scientific discoveries, and laws of physics. As a matter of fact, he established the physics he just lets man know about it through what? Revelation. He revealed it to them. Everything revealed to man will, is here to benefit the church. That's why it's here. Planes, automobiles, communication devices is to get the gospel around the world. That's why it exists. Or else he wouldn't reveal it to man. So this is way above church anity and religion what I'm talking about tonight because if your mind is limited to church anity and religion you can't see the forest for looking at what? The trees. All you can see is that one tree. Do you baptize in the name of Jesus or do you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? People actually write me about that kind of stuff. They text me. They email me. They Facebook messaged me and asked me that kind of a question. The guy asked me that the, not too long ago. I said, well, basically, I just used to say, in Jesus' name, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. <laughs> what? Now, 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 now I find the flaw. Well, no, brother, you have to use either or. Either or, not both, brother. And they're ready to stone you. Stone him. <laughs> He's a blasphemer. <laughs> You might laugh. These people really exist. They really exist. Now I'm going to show you the difference between all of that pep rally nonsense and getting worked up and getting into a frenzy about some belief system based on one tree in the forest as opposed to an abstract thinker that can see the big picture. God is looking for big minds that see the big picture to do big things. Got to see the big picture. So let's take a look at this. We're talking about no more pet rallies. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to jump off here. 2 
2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after what? The flesh. the flesh. No nobody after the flesh. No, no man. You know why? Because everybody has the spirit inspiring them. It could be God's spirit or the devil's spirit, but there's nobody flying solo down here. Say, so don't know them after the flesh. Don't think they're your buddy, your pal, and your friend. If your family members are not saved, they're inspired by the devil. Right. You got to know that. Right. Now, no man after the flesh. No man after the flesh. I got to stress that man for real. Yes, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth, what? We know. know we him no more. So forget the black stuff, the white stuff. Was he from Africa? Was he dark-skinned? Was he blue-eyed? You don't know him after the flesh at all. That eliminates any discussion about history, heritage, what race he was, and all the rest of that junk. That's, I'm reading it from your Bible. So that ends the discussion. Don't talk about it anymore. Well, brother, it's, it's important to know your history. You're in the flesh. As soon as you make that statement, you're in the flesh. Because hereafter, know we Christ no more after the flesh. If you want to be free, know Christ after the spirit and, and have an ascended mind that's not bound to time and space. There will be nobody that can chain you. Because you don't care about any of it. The discussion is a moot point to you. You're not involved in it. Because you've transcended time and space. That's the first thing you got to know about being saved and really walking in freedom. That Christ transcends time and space. So you don't have to worry about this stuff, these discussions that people have. They're on the outside looking in. They are still hung up in the matrix. You got, now understand this. You get out of that matrix... And you're unlimited in your potential because there's nothing hanging you up. You remember the move of the matrix and everybody outside of the matrix wasn't, wasn't conformed to and controlled by the matrix. They had to be put into the matrix. But they had, had their minds disconnected from the matrix so the matrix had no what? Authority or power over them. So they had to be projected into it because they were outside of it. That's walking in the spirit. Walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of your flesh. Can't you see everything the devil does through temptation is designed to pull you back into the matrix? That's why he tries to append himself to racial pride to pull you back in. Jesus was black. Jesus was white. The fact of the matter is Jesus was Semitic. Many came from Shem. Who was what? One of whose sons? One well, of Noah's sons. He was Semitic. He was a Semite. That's why when you talk about against Jews, they call you anti-Semitic. That's the, that's the truth. But who cares? Because that doesn't even matter. You know, right now, you could become a Jew, literally yourself, in a synagogue if you want to join the Jewish religion. You know, Sammy Davis Jr. became a Jew. So the Jewish religion... It's not a race. You see how jacked up folks' minds are? To be a Jew is not appended to a race. It's a religion. We, we, we have been so badly brainwashed down here that we do exactly what Jesus said. We swallow a camel and strain at a gnat. We make little things big and big things a little. The things that matter... Nobody wants to hear about it. But they want to argue about non-essentials all day long. Look at this. We don't know them after the flesh. That ends that. That's over. If you heard this message tonight, if you're listening by way of live stream, that ends all of your discussions about 5% Egyptian backgrounds, black heritage, and all the rest. Of that. That's it for you. You just heard it. It's over for you. You can walk away in 2015 
and leave that in your rear view mirror. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Well, I, hope I skipped over 17. Therefore, because we don't know, any, know Jesus after the flesh, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? Creation. Better stated, new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Here's the best way to give you an example of that. Let's say Jesus is a bus. And he's going through civilization, picking up saved people as passengers. Once you get on that bus, everything that you left outside of the bus is now outside of the bus and can't go on the bus. So everything you were is gone because now you're on this bus. Now, look, think about this logically. Jesus is picking up saved folks. He makes one stop, a white man gets on. Next stop, Hispanic man gets on. Third stop, Oriental man gets on. Fourth stop, black guy gets on. All right. All these folks on the bus, they're in Christ. Everything outside of the bus has passed away. So how can you bring any racial affiliation onto the bus? Everybody in the bus is a new creation. They're brothers by blood. Whose blood? The blood of Jesus Christ has made us all into one new man, he says in Ephesians. He was referring to Jew and Gentile. He said Christ has reconciled Jew and Gentile, making of the two one new man. And everybody on earth that's not an Israelite coming out of Abraham, uh, Abraham's loins through Isaac and Jacob, everybody outside of that lineage is a Gentile. So he's reconciled all of Abraham's lineage and all the Gentiles in Christ, making one new man. Anybody that discusses anything other than what I'm saying right now is hung up in the matrix. They're hung up. I don't care how astute they are, how brilliant they speak, how, how brilliant the oratory, they're still hung up in the matrix. You're hung up in the world. The devil found a way to stop your exodus. We're leaving the matrix by leaving his world. Get on the bus and reconcile yourself with everybody on the bus. We have the ministry, the Bible says, of reconciliation. We're reconciled to God and man in Christ. All the deviations, all the disparities are gone because in Christ, if any man be in Christ, you're a new creature. Old things, all things are passed away. And everything, he says, look and see, behold, all things are now new. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We're reconciling people to God. It's the ministry of reconciliation. Brother, you outside of Christ. You want to be made right with God? Get inside of Christ. You'll be reconciled. All the hell you're going through will go away because God has received you in Christ. We are accepted in the beloved. It's, it's so simple. It's simple. But then your mind, carnal, full of the flesh, proud, wanting to be somebody, wanting to be seen, having to make your little point. You can't see it. That's why you used the example of divorce and marriage, a remarriage. Two people got married in the world unsaved. They get divorced. They come and get saved. You tell them, well, you can't remarry because you've been married one time. And you're giving a person outside of Christ the dictates of somebody in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things are now new. God resets you to zero in Christ and you start over. But a concrete mind, a cookie cutter gospel, a cookie cutter mind will try to make everything applicable to everybody, even unsaved people. Why would you sit around trying to tell unsaved people about the word of God and how to live according to it? What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. God can't join two unsaved people together. Because they're children of the devil. I don't like this. I'm trying to set you free, lady. You sitting there not wanting to get married because you think you're going to be cursed. 
I'm the guy that's coming to unlock the prison door. You don't like me. Well, I just believe if I was divorced, I could never be remarried. And, and the Lord showed me. You know what? That Lord showed me stuff is going to get a lot of folks sent to hell. Because every time somebody wants to hide behind some delusion, they start yelling, the Lord told them. And when they're talking to you, you know, they're just as crazy as the day is long as they're talking to you, talking about what the Lord showed them. You better stop all that Lord showed you stuff. And folk like to talk like they hear the Lord like he's sitting next to them every morning when they wake up. I got up this morning, I prayed, and the Lord said to me, this, thus and so. They do that so nobody can correct them. It's a proud, arrogant, knuckle-headed defense mechanism because you want to do what you want to do. And you're just headed for a cliff. It's always the Lord showed you, the Lord told you, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, the Lord spoke it to my spirit. The Lord, Listen, man, you better stop using the Lord's name in vain and lying to yourself. Folks are going off of the deep end hearing from the Lord and it's just their minds talking to them or the devil because their lives look like chop suey and they look crazy. And the Lord told me, man, this thing here can lead you into destruction with a carnal mind. See, that's why you got to get out of the flesh so you, so you won't be crazy. Flesh trying to emulate God's kingdom, trying to emulate a Christian, will be walking around headed for a cliff and crazy and saying the Lord said it. You know how many people get in trouble and go to jail talking about the Lord said to cast this devil out of my child so I put him in the oven. <laughs> I beat him to death with a lead pipe to get the devil out of him. See, you can go off the deep end with that fake Lord stuff. I always tell folks, listen, they call me with all that Lord talk and the Lord said, I said, listen, have you considered a bologna sandwich, a bag of chips, and a Coke, and perhaps a baseball or football game or something of that nature? Have you considered going bowling? Well, the Lord, the Lord. No, listen, listen to me. Have you considered a day at the beach? Perhaps a picnic with friends. What about a game of Uno? Or a little backgammon, perhaps. See, see, you're not spirit. See, I knew you're the Antichrist. You see that stuff? You, you're trying to get me in the flesh? I, I heard a brother say this one time. He said, anybody looking at TV is not doing the will of God. I crushed my TV. I, I busted it in with a baseball bat and threw it, in the, threw it out on the street. He said a mouthful of nothing. Well, I got a TV playing this, this Derek Prince uh, CD on it. And it's showing me a lot of stuff. The DVD I'm, I'm looking at uh, what Derek Prince teaching me. And the other teachers I got playing over my TV are pretty good. This movie on Jeremiah was very informative. This movie on Moses and Abraham was very good to me. I love this movie I just saw concerning It's a Wonderful Life was pretty good during Christmas season. What? You become religious, you will lose your mind. And religious people always try to get you to conform to them. They get that pep rally in them and they get revved up in a religious fervor over something they were told and they try to then convert the world to what they got pepped up to believe. So you can't afford to go up and down like a yo-yo getting revved up, pepped up because you're going to charge out there with your sword drawn in a complete delusion and lead people into destruction. And you can't do what? You can't relate to people. You can't have a normal relationship with the person because you don't have a normal relationship with the Lord. That's why you can't relate to people normally because you can't even relate to the Lord. You never want to filter yourself through crazy. And buddy, one thing you find out about church real fast, it's a lot of kooks in church. You Look, you got to know that before you come over here talking about being saved, it's a lot of nuts, coops, and wackos in church. 
Nobody gets offended about that except for the coops and wackos. They get mad at me when I say it. But folks who look at it say, you know what? I was just thinking that last week, sitting up in church. I was looking around, and I was thinking these folks act crazy. Because they do. You can relate to some of everybody when you're really saved because you have an abstract mind and you're not here to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through the Christ that is in you. you want, you're here to save the world, not to condemn the world and damn the world. You're not someone always talking about going to hell. You're going to hell. Come on, man. Christ is larger and broader than everybody going to hell. Everybody's not going to hell. It's time to reel in from that pepped up mind and just calm down and let God transform you into his image. So you see here, we'll jump off right there that you'll know Christ no longer after the flesh. And he says, don't know anyone, no man after the flesh, because everybody's got a spiritual inspiration driving them. They're in covenant with some spirit, and you better know that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 5. 2 Thessalonians chapter 5. You know, the gospel is not that hard. You, a human being can make anything hard. I mean, they take anything. You can, you can put anything out there as far as the gospel is concerned, and somebody will try to debate it. What did I say? Second Thessalonians? Yeah. Uh, hold on a second. Let's just make sure that's right. Yeah, First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm sorry. First Thessalonians chapter 5, because there's just three chapters in Second Thessalonians. That's how, you know, you can write two more or something. You know. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse... One. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse one. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say what? Peace. Get ready for that to come down the pipe. Mm -hmm. President Obama says before he leaves office in two years, he'll have a peace treaty in Israel. That's his goal before he gets out of there. The man who brought peace to the Middle East. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you brothers are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be what? Sober. Remember that word, sober. We're going to hop on that word, sober, as opposed to a pep rally attendee. That means you got to be serious, be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, sober. Anytime you see a word repeated two to three times in one passage of scripture, you got to train your mind to, to think, that's the, that's the subject of the scripture. He's trying to say it over and over again to lock it into your mind. It says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God have not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, God has not appointed us to wrath. That's what feeds the pre-tribulation rapture theory. But the wrath of God is not poured out into the into Revelation chapter 16. The wrath of the devil is always around. He's not appointing us to God's wrath. But we fight a warfare against the wrath of the devil. We stand with armor on according to Ephesians chapter 6. Having done all to stand standing therefore. So it's God's wrath. God is not going to pour his wrath out on the church. We're not appointed to that. But the tribulation period does not encounter God's wrath until the three to five year time span in the tribulation. So you can forget most of that pre-tribulation rapture stuff. That stuff that will have you down here not prepared to deal with the coming persecution. 
He says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to, be, to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourself together and edify one another, even as also you do. So you see now, sober, sober, be sober. What does sober mean? Sober means not affected by alcohol, not drunk, clear-headed, serious, acutely aware, acutely aware. You got to be sober. You got to be aware of your surroundings. You know somebody drunk, somebody on drugs, somebody caught up in religious fervor is not aware of their surroundings. You can't go to church like a knucklehead and believe everything in church. You got to be sober, clear-headed, thinking not to be deceived. Jesus warned in Matthew 24, first thing he said concerning the tribulation period, take heed that no man deceive you. This is a thinking person's gospel. You have to use the five pounds of gray matter in your head. Don't let anybody take the ability to think away from you. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord. Now he's telling you, you got oversight. What is he referring to? Bishops, overseers. He says to know them. That's why you don't let anybody just come in amongst people and just talk to them. You got to know who's talking to you. Know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. What does admonish mean? It means to warn or reprimand someone firmly, to rebuke, to scold, to reprove, to reproach, upbraid, chastise, chide, berate, criticize, take to task, read the riot act to, advise or urge someone earnestly, warn, <coughs> warn someone of something to be avoided. That's the job of the overseers. If that's not being done, that's not an overseer. Joel Osteen is not warning you about anything. He's not an overseer. He's an illegitimate pastor, an illegitimate bishop. He's not lawfully governing the household of God. That's a fact. You can't judge him. I'm telling you that's a fact. With what's coming down the pike, if there's no oversight to warn you, that's a hireling. Yes, sir. And when the wolf comes, the hireling is going to run. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you. So you got to know those that are given oversight over you. And you got to know who's around that God has given the authority to speak into your life and warn you about what's coming. Mm -hmm. First Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, and what? Sober, serious, clear-headed. A visionary can see clearly of good Behavior given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy or filthy lucre, not, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that rules well at his own house, referring to a man, having his children in subjection with all gravity. That woman pastor stuff is the biggest delusion on this planet. That man with his wife as a co-pastor is the biggest delusion on this planet. Patriots govern the household of God, having proven themselves reliable because they govern their own homes well. That's Bible 101. It's not going to bow down or be changed for anybody. Having their children in subjection with all gravity, with all what? Seriousness. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how should he take care of the church of God? Not a novice. Not somebody that got saved last week. Not somebody like Mays who got ruined trying to jump up to become a preacher. 
Ed along with T.I. in the pulpit trying to tell somebody something. Novices. That's why they're getting eaten alive and destroyed. He says, not a novice, not a new convert, lest being lifted up with pride. That's exactly what happens to them. He fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You got to have a good reputation. Folk got to know you're a pretty good person on the outside. Because the devil will try to smear a smear campaign against you. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy or filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon. They always talk about Phoebe being a deaconess. This is the office of a deacon that God tells you in his word is governed by a man, is given to a man. It's the difference between Phoebe being a servant of the church. See, the word for deacon and servant is the same word. So folk try to transpose that over to, oh, she was a deacon. No, she was a servant of the church. This is the office of a deacon. He calls it the office of a deacon being found blameless. And he already told you it's governed by a man. Because he says in verse 11, how do you know that? Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous. What's the word again? Sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife. Now that, okay, we just got a woman disqualified. Ruling their children and their houses well. So you see that one word, sober. What does sober mean? Not affected by alcohol, not drunk, clear-headed, serious, and acutely aware. Not wrapped up in pep rallies, not getting worked up on, on watch night, jumping around and blowing bubbles to receive your seed faith offering. And you're going you're to have a blessing in return. There's a blessing on, in, coming your way in 2015. There's a new car. I, the Lord has shown me you got a husband on, on, on his way. All that stuff going to be promised tonight as people hand out make-believe blessings having heard from the Lord. False prophets will be prophesying over lives everywhere in pep rallies. You got to be sober, clear-headed, and you got to be able to function in a very volatile environment without losing your mind. Because folks are getting carried off into all kinds of delusions now. Don't go. Keep your, keep your wits about you. Mm. Um, like for people who are listening online, I know you just read the scripture about how he says verbatim that, you know, the bishop is to be a man. And the beginning of the uh, service, you said that people have to be led by the spirit. I mean, I understand, I kind of understand, but just to clarify for people who may be questioning, you know, you keep saying sober and sober. So I know it, it, at the end of the day, you have to be sober, but at the beginning, you were saying, if you feel led by the spirit, you're going to almost be led by the spirit. But if somebody says that they feel like they were led, a woman says that she felt like she was led to be a bishop, even though this says in scripture. Not that she can't be one. Right. That it's for a man. But well, 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 okay, that's a simple answer right there. How can you be led by the spirit contrary to the word of God? It's impossible. <laughs> That would make God schizophrenic. You can't do anything outside this this word. Right, but you remember how you said it again. The yeah, and I used the example of the divorce right. and remarriage, and I didn't take you in anywhere outside the Bible. Not one trace outside the Bible. Not one trace. Jesus said. You can't be divorced saving for the cause of pornea, fornication. You go into other books where Paul is writing, he addressed circumstances as they occurred on the spot. See, you got to understand the Bible formats itself that it's going to tell you the same thing over and over again to make it clear. We're going to go right to Titus and we'll see, the, see him say the same thing again about the office of a, of a bishop and, and church authority. He gonna, if he says it two or three times, you got a witness established. Now, what the Bible will do is Jesus will say something and then the Bible will then amplify it or modify it. In other words, 
if you if you set yourself down right here on the earth and you look at society at large, you look at the home, you know the father is the head of the home. You know the mother is a helpmeet in the home and the children are in obedience. It said explicitly that the father that the father is the head, the mother is the help help me and the children are in obedience. You go to first Corinthians chapter eleven, says the head of the man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and you know then the head of Christ is God, and the children are in, under that jurisdiction are in obedience. You can't take a authority in the home, take it to church and flip it on his head. Why would you take a father with a mother and a child in that sequence in the home, take it to church and flip the whole thing on his head with a woman over that whole family? It makes no sense. The word family in the Greek is the word for a unit led by a father, a patriarch. A patriarch is a, is a man. It's a, it's a man that has a lineage. A patriarch is a family unit. A pater is a father in the Greek. So it's all about fatherly order in place. Under that order, now the Holy Ghost has authority to operate in the church because the order is right. But it's until we get the order right, we can't have anything done because we don't have divine order. So you got to set the church in order before the Holy, Holy Ghost is going to move. So if a woman steps up and tries to take over God's church, you just, you just defunctionalize the whole church. There's no order. See, that's what I'm saying about abstract thinkers and concrete thinkers. With an abstract mind, you can see the big picture that, that's trying to be painted. But with a concrete mind, you'll never see it. See, it's, it's no way for me to explain it to a concrete mind because they can't see it. They can't, they can't make the, the adjustments in their mind to understand that this thing is just like trying to grab a hold of water. If you grab a handful of water, you, you're going to have, you're going to pull back a handful of nothing but wet, but it's going to dry up in a minute. Because you can't, you can't grasp abstracts and grab a hold of them. But at the same time, this Bible is given for us to actually function in this abstract world without being deceived. So you, the Spirit is going to let you know when you're dealing with a situation in front of you that it's above you. You can't, you can't handle this because I just said you can send a woman back home to be killed. And you got to be, be in touch with God to know that's above, that's out of your pay grade. You can't deal with that, man. This woman telling you she's getting herself almost beat to death every night, and you telling her based on the letter to go back home, man, I, I'm not stepping over there. Like people with a terminal illness tell, asking me, should I go to the doctor and, and have surgery or should I believe God? That's how I say, my pay grade, man. I ain't going over there. Because you know what they're going to do? As soon as that family member dies, they're going to point their finger right at you and say, you told them not to go to the doctor. And you are responsible. I get enough stuff coming to me right now where people go off the DB and they come looking right for me saying, didn't they go over there to make or didn't they have something to do with that church? That they, this person went crazy. Well, okay. Well, what did I do to them? Were they crazy before they came around? What, I mean, I don't, I don't know nothing about this. What are you talking about? People always look for a fall guy and a reason to blame somebody. That's why you got to be led by the Holy Ghost. Right. But the foundation of the church stands sure. Twelve patriarchs in the Old Testament, twelve apostles in the New. Then he gives you the governmental order in 1 Timothy and Titus, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It goes on and on. You go to Revelation, you see the gates and the pillars of that church are built on those 12 apostles of the of, a, of, of the Lamb and the twelve patriarchs of Israel. God is a father. He's got a son. You don't see no, a mother mentioned nowhere in the Bible. It's patriarchal. Through and through. See, that's a fact. Now, under that patriarchal authority, you got to be able to be filled with the Holy Ghost to deal with life. Without the patriarchy, you got no foundation even to deal with situations. So I know what you're coming from. They'll hear me say that when I start now. Well, see, the woman is, was led by the Spirit to be a pastor. Hey, this Bible just disempowered that. I didn't write it. It says what it says. You can't get around it. And he gives explicit instructions and directions as to who qualifies to be a pastor. That's foundational stuff. After the foundation is laid, now you can operate. As a matter of fact, a woman can't be a pastor, but a woman can be a teacher. 
she'll do the same thing a pastor does without the title. You know what the problem is? I want the title. Why you want the title? You'll do the same thing. So I can have authority over somebody. I want to be over people. That's all it's about for real. It's not about... I mean, how can you... If you led, uh, the Lord led me to be a pastor, what is that? As a woman, what are you talking about? What have you achieved? As a matter of fact, to be honest with you, the way the church is set up with a pastor, that's not even right. It's not governed by a pastor. There are groups of elders, and it's, it's, it's a body of, of pastors in the church, not one person. It's a body ministry. So what you trying? To, what high chair are you trying to get into? It doesn't even exist. So, you know, it's a moot point. Anyway, but I know where you're coming from, though, Mr. It's, it's a good question because you will have people sitting there trying to find a way around whatever you say. So you did head it off at the past. All right, look at... Um, the contrast here in First Timothy chapter 4. Now, notice how in First Timothy chapter 3, talking about the, 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 the shepherds, the bishops, and the deacons, he set up order in the church. Now, watch the contrast in chapter 4. Now, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Those are those women that were led by the spirit to become a pastor. That's the contrast. See, I just told you the order, but in the latter days, some, some are going to depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and go against this order. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So you see what happened? He tells you the standard for order. Then tells you in the latter days they're going to go against the order. That's what he's talking about. They're going to set up all kinds of contrary ritualistic commands telling you not to get married, not to eat certain things, and all this other stuff because they're going contrary to the order he outlined in chapter 3. Verse 6 it says in chapter 4, If you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wise fables and the exercise fables and be exercised and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise having promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. So you see now the doctrine, good doctrine, sound doctrine is necessary. If you know what the Bible is given for, you can understand it. The Bible is not given for you to walk in the letter. Remember, he said the letter killeth, but the spirit gives life. The Bible is given to change you so you can relate to God and you have his mind. That's why a lot of questions are unanswerable because you got to have the mind of Christ and be able to relate to him to understand the answer. See, I mean, it's something that's, that can't be taught. It has to be lived out. It has to happen to you. And it all makes sense when you see the big picture. If you see the big picture, you can understand the big program, the big mind of God. God's mind is big. It's expansive. If you start thinking narrow-minded, concrete thoughts, you'll miss God by a million miles. Because God has a big plan for salvation. He's got a big vision. And he's on the move doing things that actually surpass all the little stuff the devil does to you. I mean, that stuff the devil does in contrast to what God is planning is, is, is just totally inconsequential. So you see now that contrast in 1 Timothy chapter 3 with the doctrines of demons in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look at Titus chapter 1. He goes right into Titus chapter 1. And again, he verifies this. Now, we're talking about being sober in the orderly environment in order for God to really move. First Timothy chapter, I mean, I'm sorry, Titus chapter 1, verse 5. For this cause, Paul talking to Titus, left out the Crete that you should set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed you. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife 
having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he, had, as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers or those that speak against the gospel. See, a gainsayer is somebody that speaks against the gospel. So again, you see a bishop, first thing out of his mouth, the husband of one wife. The husband of one wife. That disqualifies all women. They even got lesbians now trying to have first ladies in the church. It's crazy. And if you don't have that foundation right, the Bible tells us if the foundation is not sure, nothing can be built. Jesus said, don't build your house on sand. Build it on rock. Build it on a strong foundation. If the foundation of the church is undermined and patriarchal masculine authority is not there, everything is convoluted, twisted, and, and just totally perverted. You've got to have the foundation brought back. And to do that, you need sober-minded, serious men. Notice how many men are put forth as comedians in, in, in the environment. Just jokesters, clowns, laughing, stupid, ignorant, babbling fools, singing rap music and hip-hop. Just babbling idiots, walking around with your pants pulled down to your knees, covered in tattoos, crazy. That's the devil's image of a man. He's a babbling fool that cannot be trusted. He's not sober, can't make a decision. He's not decisive. He can't lead anybody. So a lot of women just blow this fool off. He's a clown. They are married to men that they see as clowns. They'll tell you that. Well, my husband's a fool. He, he, don't, he don't know anything. He's just a stupid fool. And I got to do everything because that fool will go and mess it up. I'm sick of his stupid butt. Can't send him to do nothing. That's how they talk. Say, ma'am, are you married to the guy? Don't you have his last name? Yeah, I married that fool. I'm thinking, man, that's a bit, that's some bitter, that's some bitter water right there, buddy, to drink. <laughs> Bible says, lest the root of bitterness springing up and many be the fire. You can't trust them. All of them, no good. They cheating on you. And this fool running around with a woman now. I, I, I had to go and curse her out. The food and got into a bunch of mess. She done got into our checking account and took the money out of the bank. And the, the fool and done this and the fool has done that. The fool, the fool, the fool. The... <laughs> Jesus said, don't call people a fool. You're going to be in danger of hellfire. You better stop. <laughs> and married to the person. No respect for them. Always undermining, always degrading them, always downgrading them in public. They see men as in adequate fools so a lot of women they write me email me they talk to me like I'm a boy like well so you said this and that and the other but the Lord showed me I said listen ma'am I could care less what the Lord showed you I don't care what he showed you I'm telling you how to live I can't stand him I can't stand him hate him why do you hate me when I am your friend your only friend, the way you are, I'm your only friend. Everybody else hates you. I'm your only friend. But what it is, is they want to undermine a man. They want to make you believe you don't know what you're talking about. See, never mistake a guy that has authority that speaks with absolutes with pride. Because if you, you got to have thick skin to do with this right here. You can't afford to be a tenderoni and easily offended and weak and getting run over and double thinking yourself and wondering if it's right or not. No, man. This is the way you walk in it. If you notice how God deals with through a guy, Moses went to Pharaoh. He didn't ask Pharaoh no questions. Nathan didn't ask David anything. You are the man. When Isaiah went to Hezekiah, you're going to die and not live. And the, he, he didn't want to hit the door. You don't fool around talking to people. Absolutes. God is not a uh, person that deals in situational ethics. God speaks in absolutes. This is the way and you better walk in it.
I don't like that. I don't like how you talk. I don't like you being confident about what you're saying and being so sure. Because my sissy husband, all my sissy boyfriends and my sissy daddy was always double-minded and scary and I could flex on him and he, he start, his knees would start knocking together. You know how many women do that? They'll raise their voice and watch a man get scared. Get an attitude in the guy. Well, baby, no, 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 look, look. Man, I get tired. I don't want to put up with her because, man, I don't want to hear she She's going to start that, man. I don't even want to hear it. What, I mean, I, I don't even want to go through it. Man, you know, she getting mad, man. You, you don't want to make her mad, man, because here we go. And, and they, be sitting, they be sitting there with, scared to death the woman going to come in and start a ruckus. I'm going to tell you this one time. You come over here and start a ruckus and see what you get. <laughs> Nobody's scared of you. All these folks talking about their prophetesses and evangelists. And all. Nobody care about that. Because God getting ready to move through here for real. And he's going to raise up patriarchal authority. And anybody that gets in his way like Ananias and Sapphira did are going to get steamrolled. It's not pretty. See, people make a bad mistake when they mistake, they mistake God's kindness for weakness. That's a bad mistake. That's a bad mistake. Because they think he can't do anything. He says he winks at your ignorance for a season. Then he calls everybody to repentance. You got to change. Yes. See, think about it now. Whatever, wherever you're at right now, you might have to repent because you might be wrong. What if he's been weakening at you in, in your stupidity? What if you've been passing the church of the woman and God is just winking at you? And that word in the Greek is, I've been shutting my eyes at you. I've been ignoring you and not looking at you. What if he starts looking at you now? And it comes after you. God sends a forerunner to warn you. A forerunner warns you so he won't have to deal with you. God tries to deal with the human hands off. He'll send people. Because if he comes, it's over. Jesus said it this way. Fall on me, you'll be broken. If I fall on you, I'm going to grind you to powder. And a lot of big mouth, arrogant, proud, know-it-all women are going to get ground to powder. Because they would not his reproof. He sent warnings and they wouldn't listen. It is what it is. God's government is what it is. It's not going to change. If there's any change that's got to be done, we've got to do it. But this reign of terror of this Jezebel spirit stomping around with people scared of them. Men are scared to death of women. They're scared of them. To the degree they hate them. They're so scared of them. You ever heard the lyrics of hip hop and rap? All they talk about is bending some girl over and slamming her in the bed and making her suck penises and drinking her, choking her semen down her mouth and doing this to her and that to her and Get my buddies and the rest of my dogs. And I'm all of us going to do this to you and do that to you because they hate women. Hip hop is a genre for in homosexual men. And the homosexual men who get on the bus in the church bring the hip hop on the bus because they steal sissies. Whenever you're about talking about gospel hip hop and gospel rap, you're looking at a homosexual spirit that don't want to let hip hop go. That's all it is. I don't like that. I don't care if you don't like it. I'm telling you, it ain't coming over into the church. Get it out of the church and get it out now. And to get it out of the church, get it out of you. I don't like how you talk. I know because you're a girl. You're a girl that can't take command. That's what's wrong with you, man. You still got that girl you got in you from Lil Wayne, that girl you got in you from Jay-Z, that girl you got in you from 2 Chains, that girl you got in you from Nicki Minaj's butt all day, and it made you into a woman. You're feminine inside, so you can't take the heat of battle, and you can't take commands in a military environment. This is a wartime environment for sober-minded people. It's not pretty. It's not for tenderonies. It's not for thumb suckers. Whether you be male or female. Did you not know a woman that gets saved take on a military mindset? She becomes a woman out of the womb of a man and just an extension of a man. She'll have the same character and concrete pour to her than a man has. And she'll stand with the man in war. And a woman that's really a woman won't like a sissy either. That's why you know the women are perverted 
because they hang around homosexuals. Anytime you see a woman hanging around a homosexual, you got a perverted, upside down, twisted woman. Because a woman has no affinity to be around a homosexual whatsoever. How are you going to get a woman out there getting married with a homosexual planning her wedding? You see how twisted that is? What does this dude know about you and your wedding? And telling you what to wear, what colors look good, what looks good in the ballroom. And they'll tell you, well, homosexuals have good taste. I, I just love homosexuals' taste. Man, I'm going to have a homosexual do my wedding because they know. You a woman? This is a twisted world. And I'm not backing off of it one inch. I'll take this to my grave. Because if you change this thing and make it an upside down represent, representation of God's kingdom, upside down representation, the devil's going to have free reign to destroy everybody on this planet. Because you got no governors. You got nobody to stand the watch. You got nobody with eyes to see. He would have blinded the church and he took over the world. You might think you want to do what you're doing, but you better take my advice and stop. First Peter chapter 4. I wish it was pretty, but this ain't a, this ain't a pet rally on watch night. This is reality. 12 o'clock right now, straight up. Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> See, because the train just keeps on rolling. All this Happy New Year stuff and all these holidays and stuff. That stuff don't make any difference, man. We had to do a job. I'm here to do a job, get it over with, and get out of here. Folks who are looking to live down here and have longevity on this planet, I feel sorry for you. The Bible tells you if you have hope only in this life, you are of all men most miserable. And I'm infallible there because Lincoln Cemetery proves me right. Why would you hope in this life and you got a cemetery full of folks that are dead already and you're following in their footsteps? You, it's stupid to have hope in this life because you're dying. You got to leave here. First Peter chapter 4 verse 7. But the end of all things is where? At hand. At hand. Because the end is at hand, be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. You want to have a watch night? It should be a praying night, not a pep rally. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging, as, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Everybody's got a gift. Everybody's got a charisma. It's a manifold grace. Then you got different gifts in the body. So everybody should be ministering according to the grace you have and your gift you have. Nobody knows what your gift is. It has to be brought to the surface by the Holy Ghost so you can minister to other people in the body. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God gives, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Then he says this. Beloved. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed you, shall, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If so be. Re if, if you be reproached for the name of Christ. Happy are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinners appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So you see now judgment begins at church and we're just barely getting in. So you know the people that are damned are going to be totally ostracized and cast away. We're being judged and we're being brought to a place where we're being saved. 
And he says, if the righteous are scarcely being saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner even appear? That's why you got to be sober. That's why you got to take everything seriously. I can't afford to sit across the table for somebody counseling them and not taking their life situation seriously. Because they can get killed if you tell them the wrong thing. That's why you got to have a sober, clear mind and not a letter carrier that's quoting scriptures to people. You got to be able to get in contact with Jesus Christ in real time, having complete contact with his mind. Many of you got a contact with his nature, the fruit of his spirit. You got some uh, a relationship based on experience, not a novice. You've been around a while, been around the block a few times. So you're not easily shaken by things. It's so many people jumping up on the internet trying to preach it folks and can make YouTube tapes and tell people how to live. Man, you're going to get your head knocked off in this. This is not for somebody playing. You got to be serious. Because you better know one thing. You say something about Jesus Christ, the devil's coming to see you. And you better be ready when he gets there. Because he got a million ways to deceive you and to undermine you and destroy you. Right. And you can't be playing with, 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 with this when, when you walk with God because Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Look what he says here in 1 Peter chapter 5. The elders which are among you, I exhort who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be, that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not for money, but, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. That's why I'm talking about a letter carrier trying to tell you what to do from the letter and out of a natural mind. A lot of folks set themselves up over God's flock. No, you're an example to the flock. If you're going to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you got to become a servant of all. That's how you know who labors among you. That's where you know where real leaders are because they wash everybody's feet. They serve everybody. They're not taking from you. They're trying to distribute to you the resources necessary for this life. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, you younger, submit yourself unto the elder. That's lost on this planet. Yes, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with what? Humility. For God resisteth the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due, in due time or in his time, in his right season. He's going to raise you up and show you to the world in his time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be what? So Man, I, 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 he can't say this enough for us to realize what he's saying. Have a serious, clear mind. Be sober. Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. You get out here playing with this if you want to. There's a lot of folks that come here trying to bring hip hop and rap into the church. They went right back into fornication, proud, because the stuff they're bringing in has too much pride appended to it. They even try to rap the just hip hop stuff in church with a proud arrogance about them. That's not the nature of God. You can't take the unclean and sanctify it. It's unclean. It, didn't, it wasn't inspired by God from Jump Street. Now you're trying to wash it up, clean it up, and bring nasty hip-hop into the church. I can't bring Parliament Funkadelic in the church. I can't bring Luther Vandross in the church. I can't bring Madonna into the church. I can't bring the Temptations and Smokey Mark Robinson and the Miracles into the church. I can't bring the Temptations into the church. I can't bring none of that stuff into the church. Yet you can bring hip-hop into the church. Why is it you get saved in your generation, you drop everything, burn up every record, tear up everything and throw it in a dumpster, 
And then now this generation wants to drag the trash they were in over into the church. Somebody said the other day, it used to be you needed vocal training. You needed uh, some ability to play a, a musical instrument. You needed some ability to read music. You need some ability to write music. But now to be a star, all you need is a Mac. Because they make all the beats electronically. Now they got to do is stand there and talk. Cussing like a dog. Think about the star. They just stand there cussing like a dog. Nigga Minaj saying all this nasty stuff about who she elfed. I elf. I didn't elf Drake. I didn't elf uh, Wayne. I didn't. And, and, and I did this and did that and I, I sucked this and sucked that. That's her, that's her music. That's, that's, that's making her a star. They have her on national TV. On all these TV shows. Good Morning America and all this. Knowing what she's saying now. And still promoting her. In any other given time in civilization. She's been a straight jacket. Yeah. In an asylum. You see how degraded the world is? Here's somebody that's driven mad right before your very eyes and you're promoting them as a star with no musical ability whatsoever, none, and making records. Think about it. You're making a CD, a recording, with no musical ability whatsoever. What instrument does Jay-Z play? I mean, I could get there, you know... <laughs> Okay, let's say I'm okay, let's say I'm Jay-Z. You take the Bible or this verse, beloved think not strange concerning all uh, the fiery trial which is try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> but rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with the seed in joy. That's how much sense that makes. This nut is sitting there with some paper in front of him and reading some junk off to a beat and folk bopping around to the beat. And now he's worth $600, $800 million. You can take the encyclopedia and read it starting at A. And just read the encyclopedia. You see how stupid it is? That's crazy. Any, meeny, miny, mo. Catch a monkey by the toe. If he, I don't let him go. Any, meeny, miny, mo. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. You can say anything in a, in a song and they'll buy it. Pull up to somebody in traffic and listen to that crazy jump. Got her down shoes on, you don't even know it. See, it's, stupid. it's stupid, it's crazy. That's what they're really saying. Got killer with me right now, you don't even know it. Got me in the house, you don't even know it. No new friends, no new friends. Nah, nah, nah. Still down with my day one crew. I got no new friend, no new friend. <laughs> I, 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 am I making it up? I'm telling the truth. <laughs> J-Lo. Got a big booty, got a big, 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 big booty, got a big... <laughs> We have come to this. We, the human race has really degraded to an insane asylum. That's why you've got to be sober. See, guys, if you're not sober, you'll be insane with these people. You can't afford to discuss this with them. You can't afford to try to understand it, analyze it, go back and forth about it. I tell a brother, I say, look, you want hip-hop in the church, go ahead and knock yourself out. I'm, I don't want no pause of it. Go over there, you and the people that believe in that, y'all going over there and do what you do. Don't talk to me about it. You're judgmental, you're narrow-minded. See, you, you can't judge. Nobody judges me but God. I didn't say anything to you. I said you and the people that believe that go over there and have it. If you're right, you'll be all right. If you're wrong, you'll be crazy. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. God inspires his music and he receives back in heaven what he inspires. If God doesn't inspire it, he doesn't receive it back in heaven. What you think up in your own mind is garbage and is strange fire.
That's the way it goes. The folk hadn't been born again, baptized, and filled with the Holy Ghost to know the mind of God, to give God back what he wants. Yes. That's the problem. So they came in and drilled the world with them and tried to make the church accept the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John chapter 2. So you see now, again, sober, be serious, as opposed to having a carnal mind, which is not serious. Romans 8, it, it tells you all the places where the carnal mind is engaging you, trying to stop you. That's what's taking the seriousness out of you. The carnal mind is a mind that's bathed in nothing but entertainment. It's all it wants. It wants to be entertained and it wants to feel pleasure. That's what the carnal mind does. It wants no discipline. It wants no sobriety. It wants to just have fun. So I got so many arrested people now in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Man, if you're a woman, and especially women, because a lot of women get more serious than guys. You know, women mature faster than guys anyway. So a lot of young women get serious at 20, and then sitting next to a boob that's still 12 in his, in his mind. So the women are now downgrading themselves to accommodate an arrested man. And God forbid you start getting 25, 30, 35, 40, and, the, and you, you, you're looking at boys in your peer group that have not matured. They're still running around with their caps on backwards, and he's standing there 45 years old, trying to go to the club. You old rusty joker. It's over. <laughs> what are you doing? They don't want to grow up. They're arrested. Arrested. And I tell women, don't downgrade one thing for these clowns. What does he say in Romans chapter 8, verse 7? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If the carnal mind is the focal point that tells you what puts you in the flesh, having a carnal mind. The carnal mind places you in the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual that judges all things yet he himself is judge of no man. For who have known the mind of the Lord that he might instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ diametrically opposed to the carnal mind, the mind of Christ. And let me say this. What I'm teaching right now, it has to happen to you. You cannot just do this. It has to actually be birthed in you, gestated in you, and manifested in you. You can't just stop having a carnal mind. Like you hear this message and say, oh, that's the problem. I have a carnal mind. I'm not going to have one in the morning. Yes, you will. You got to go through progressive steps of deliverance to get rid of a carnal mind. Because it was born in you. It was actually amplified in you and strengthened through sin and it sits in your head as the only thing you have to process data until God eradicates it. 2 Corinthians 10 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 for we walk in the flesh for though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So you see again the target with your weapons of warfare is the mind, thoughts, imaginations that exalt themselves above God. Your mind that's carnal will always fight against spiritual inputs coming from your spirit to change it. You, you kneel to pray, cursing in your mind. Because your mind don't like the fact you kneel to pray. See, your mind is going to cut on the fight. It's a carnal mind. It's an essence. It's an actual entity in you that does not want to abdicate the throne. It's been governing you in covenant with demons, and it's governing you. Everything you do spiritual. 
the carnal mind gonna begin to try to put drag on you, slow you up. Don't don't do that. Don't 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 go. Don't don't go to church. Don't don't go to prayer. If you're praying, I'm cursing. You sob. You mf. Or you you son of a so and so. You dirty. <laughs> you know you get cussed out inside of you. You got to know that. So you want. He said that's why it says casting down the imaginations and the things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. It's an internal fight until God finally drives the stake through that. Stinking, filthy, carnal mind. Ephesians chapter 4. See, most folks don't even talk about this kind of stuff, but it's real. This I say, therefore, verse 17, and testify the Lord that you, henceforth you, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity, the vanity, the uselessness of their mind. Mateo test is that word. It means depravity, uselessness, and emptiness. Don't walk like the Gentiles who walk in the uselessness of their mind, the, the, the depravity, depravity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. So you see now, again, that mind. What does he say in verse 23? And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It's the spirit of your mind. There's an esoteric part of you that makes up your mind. Nobody can reach inside of you and take your mind out of you. They can take your brain out. They can't take your mind out. You really don't know where thoughts come from. Because they're esoteric. They have no concrete essence to them. Thoughts are abstract. Now notice how everything God has to modify and change in us is abstract. Thoughts, feelings, inclinations. All these different things that make us operate down here. Our perceptions. Little things about us. Little, little nuances and innuendos in us that make us click. How you see something. How you feel that somebody feels about you. You know how many people write me and say, you know, uh, you preach the gospel real hard and straightforward. And, and uh, you know, you, you got a, um, a hard word. No, it's not. It's normal. You've just been under soft stuff so long that, that anything normal seems hard to you. See, that's a nuance that's built into the human. There's nothing hard about what I'm saying. You've just been under a sissy preacher or sissy ministry so long that a normal talking person seems hard. You watch a woman. I've seen, I mean, I've seen this happen over and over again in my life. You watch a woman that's been around a sissy guy all of her life and get around a real normal guy. She can't take it. Just hey, why is he so loud? Is... Do you not understand? That's why women teachers in the school beat your boy down. You got a normal, two-fisted, regular Joe Blow son, and they're telling you he's a troublemaker and he, he needs written. He's ADHD or ADD. That's not the problem. They're not used to being around a boy. They raised their sons as a sissy. Their husband is a sissy. Their daddy was a sissy. Their brothers are sissies. So you got a two-fisted, everyday, nasty, stank, muddy boy that's normal. And he's got a problem. So they teach the kid sissy sensitivity. And when they act like a girl, he's normal. That's why they need more male teachers to deal with these old two-fisted roughneck boys. To jack them up. That's all they need. This ain't even hard to understand, y'all. The carnal mind seeks out the entertainment and pleasure. If you have a carnal mind, you'll begin to live the sequences out found in Romans chapter 1. Don't go there, but beginning in Romans chapter 1, you end up in reprobation after going through uncleanness and all kinds of depravity and homosexuality. You end up reprobate because your carnal mind corrupted inside of your head. All you have to do is trace your own life and try to sit back one day and analyze. Don't do it, but if you think about it, how did I get way over there from where I was in the third grade? I was in the third grade, just the normal everyday Kid, goofing off, 
You a girl with ribbon in your hair, two little plaits draped down on either side. How do you get way over from there to way over here? The carnal mind. Feed on the world, ingest the filth of the devil, modified your behavior. Remember, behavioral modification is not salvation. I just stopped doing one thing and started doing another. I stopped going to the club, going to the church now. I stopped cursing. Now I'm, I'm saying hallelujah, praise the Lord all the time. Behavioral modification is not salvation. Stopping and starting stuff is not salvation. It won't get you born again. You got to be a new creation. So the refusal to engage in God's spiritual war against his enemies leads to corruption of the mind and total depravity. What's the problem? Seeking after entertainment and pleasure. I don't want to fight a war. So I corrupt inside because I won't engage in God's war. You got to understand this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, he said, listen, either you will gather with me or you will scatter against me. You see, if you don't come to Jesus and get engaged in the warfare against his enemies, you will turn against him. And what I'm saying now, you won't like it. You won't like it because you're anti-Christ inside. When you have this, this thing in you that's carnal, you're corrupting. all. It's going to corrupt all by itself. It's an apple off of the tree sitting on your kitchen table for six months. You leave an apple on your kitchen table for six months and see what you'll have at the end of six months. A black, corrupted, stank apple. So what you're going to have? That's what human, humankind has become. It's corrupting and corruption cannot be reversed. So sum it up. Wrap it up. Here's what we got. We got a carnal mind versus a spiritual mind. We got to cross over that divide from being carnal to spiritual and, and the and the and the place where the war must be fought is in our minds. God gave remedies for our problem. The cross is God's answer to stop the carnal mind. God does not renovate. He does, he does not try to restore it. He does not try to fix it. He kills it. Mortification is what happens. At the cross, God killed Adam and his mind. It's a done deal 2,000 years ago. So what's happening? The devil is still giving us the images, the nuances. He's trying to keep Adam alive through what the doctor does in the hospital when you're dead, a brain dead. Artificial life support. How does he do it? In the world. All he's doing is using the world as an artificial stimuli to keep your mind thinking about his stuff so the way to kill the carnal mind is just unplug it unplug it from the world and the thoughts will cease they'll die don't think about it don't meditate on it don't have anything to do with it yes. carnal Christians that want to talk about it cut them off yes. cut off everything yes. and if you don't stimulate the carnal mind it must die it's living on life support. It was killed 2,000 years ago. And yet the devil has an amusement park for those to seek after entertainment and pleasure. So you never become sober, serious to fight a warfare. Remember, relationship-based people will never have the ability to interact with people who are information based. Information is for carnal church people. They get Bible scriptures, Bible quotations, they get lessons taught, they got a lot of information. I, I mean, I, I, I couldn't begin to tell you how many people contact me because we're on the internet, on live streaming YouTube and different places. And they come trying to convince me what we're saying is wrong based on information. They got all kind of historical stuff and all kinds of quotes from different preachers and what somebody else taught. They always trying to feed me a YouTube clip from some preacher that said something and look at this, look at that, look at this, look at that. That's all information. A Christian doesn't live off of information. Information 
comes from data given from the world and resources you can investigate and you can do research on. Revelation comes by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. You ever read the Bible and the Holy Ghost took a scripture and revelated it to you? You can read it five million times. And one time you read it and all of a sudden it spring off the page and hit you. That's, that's because you got the revelation of it. That's not information. That's revelation. A Christian lives off of revelation, not information. And the two cannot walk with each other. If you've been a church person, going to church, listening to sermons, and you, you'll get all these different teachers. That sound, they're brilliant orators. They sound good talking. It's just information. I can go back in time to, to the Charles Stanleys and the and the, uh, 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 all the different John MacArthur and all these different guys that just been to seminary, got information. They're very studious. They're very intelligent. They're very articulate. It's just information, though. It's like a college professor talking to you. It's information. What's the difference? Information will lead to you being proud with a lot of data. Revelation will lead you to have power to stop the devil. You need power. You don't need information. You need power. This thing ain't found in word. It's found in power. Why do we need power? We got to be sober because we're dealing with a sober enemy. Didn't he just tell you? Your adversary, the devil, is walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may he swallow whole. He talked about like, a, a, like a, a huge anaconda swallowing a prey whole. Devour is the word he used. So therefore, I can't afford to play with this fool because he's looking to kill me. The devil is a killer. And most Christians never process the fact we're in a life and death struggle. You got to be sober to do that. So here's where the rubber meets the road. You got to get a band of people, male and female, who sell the farm and say, you know what? I'm going to pursue power. My objective in Christianity from this point on is to pursue power and not, not make apologies of it. People will, try, people will immediately stop, try to stop you tell them that. You tell them, hey, look, brother, I'm going to tell you what. I'm, I'm after power. I want power. I'm coming to church seeking power. Well, brother, that's kind of proud. You, gotta, you, know, they're gonna, you know what the demon are gonna, and them going to say? The love demon going to show up. Well, you, well, we just need to love each other. I think if we love each other and we show each other the right affection and we care for each other. And we feed the poor and we house those that don't have homes. And if we just do all those things, the love of God will hide multitudes of sins and people will be saved because it's in the love. It's the love, brother. It's the grace and the love and the mercy. All this power stuff, that stuff Christ is telling you about power, that's arrogance. That's very proud. It has no caring and concern for the human race. All right, man, you got a blind man that's crippled and maimed. You can clothe him, feed him, and, and, and shelter him. I can heal his eyes, get him out of that wheelchair, and restore his two legs to normal. Yeah. Who's got love for the guy, me or you? Yeah. Power. Read the Bible. Paul says, I didn't come with enticing words of man's wisdom. I come to demonstrate power. It's talking versus power. So now we know we're stalled out here and there's no power. Now the question is, who's going to adamantly seek the power? Going in 2015 now, 365 days just went by, like two days. It was just January 1st, like last week. And here it is, January 1st again. Another 365 days of powerless existence just walking around in the wilderness talking about Jesus and the word and God and quoting scriptures. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing all this talking. It's too much talking. Somebody got to just turn the plate over and pursue power until power comes. You got people right now, it's 1235. 
They spent the night from 10 o'clock to now jumping around listening to a bunch of prophecies and lies and uh, in, a, in a pep rally. Just, just, and it's going to all boil down to nothingness by the morning, by daylight. And it's just going to start another process of weeks and months and, and, and years going by of the same old tri tripe and trash. Who can sit through this anymore? That's why I say no more pet rallies, man. No more talking. No more working nobody up. No more, you know, turn to your neighbor and tell them, neighbor. <laughs> Going to keep it clean in 2015. You know, look, man. Look. <laughs> Stop, man. Stop. Tell your neighbor, neighbor. The Lord is on my side. Tell him again. Say, neighbor. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Say it. Say it. Look him in the eyeball, eyeball to eyeball contact. Tell him, neighbor, the Lord is on your side. How, how much more can you take? How much more can you do this? How much longer are you going to do this? Well, the insanity walking the streets, crazy all around you, cannibalism coming to the forefront. Man, we got to have some power. It's time to seek the Lord for power. You got to have targeted prayer. I'm coming down here on my knees to pray for power. That's why I came. I'm coming for power. That's why I'm in here. I'm, I'm here to be filled with power. To seek the Holy Ghost is to seek power. Did you know that? The tiebreaker is going to be the one to come back with power. Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He came back in the power of the spirit. The tiebreaker is going to end the talking. Now, Joel Osteen can talk all day. Oprah can talk all day. Dr. Oz can talk all day. Bill O'Reilly can talk all day. Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh. Talk, talk, talk. When you got power, you don't have to talk. Think about what I'm saying. There's nothing to talk about. Blind bottom man can see. The man says, look, you ask me all these questions, you want me to explain myself. All I know is I was blind and now I can see. That's all I can tell you, man. Now, the theory and the analysis and the physics of it all and how we did it, I don't know. I was standing over there blind and now I can see. And he said, here it is a marvelous thing. You couldn't open my eyes and yet you won't believe in the one that did. This is, this is really weird. You couldn't help me. That's where this is headed. When God raises up the real and demonstrates himself through it, man, it's going to be on and popping. It's going to be tumultuous now. It's going to be a wild ride because they're going to be mad at you. But at that point, who cares? Look, let's get serious as we wrap this up and pray. God is alive. He's real. What I'm saying right here in this chair has an essence to it. It's carrying weight. It's carrying power. It's carrying the essence of God in what I'm saying. Yes. He's alive. That's why it's like that. Yes. That's why it impacts people. That's why you think about it going home and meditate upon it and it bugs you and it irritates you and it you know, makes you look back on it and you think about it. If that weren't the case, you wouldn't be around this this long. God is alive. But in our generation... We have not experienced a visitation from it. That's what I'm after. I'm after a visitation where something happens. But when it jumps off, I was talking to my son tonight. He was saying, he said, look, I know I need to get saved. You know what he said? He said, I know I need, but I'm not going to play. If I come, I'm going to be for real. I'm going to really get saved. He said, I, he said, I just, this is what he says, I, I just asked God for grace and mercy so I have time to come when I want to get right. I said, listen, man, you're out of time. You can forget that. The time is now because it's the end of the world. I said, when this thing jump off, you might be too late. A day short and a dollar late because, hey, or a day late and a dollar short. Because when this thing jumps off, it's going to be on the pop it moving fast. You wasting time because you got to get ready for God to move. You can't control when God is going to do something. I said, God can do something tonight and you'll be left out. 
A lot of promises in the Bible. Tomorrow is not one of them. Yeah. Tonight, he says, your soul is required of you. What if God decides that you die tonight? It's, life and death is, in, is in, in God's hands. He decides who leaves here and when. We take a lot for granted walking around down here. But the sooner we get to the power, the better off we'll be. Soberness. Keep that one word in mind. That you talk to people, you watch how much they play about God. Laugh about God. Joke about God. They think everything's funny. John Belushi back in years ago playing on Saturday Night Live had made the mistake of joking about the Holy Ghost pretending to talk in tongues. I don't know if he lived another month. See, because he, he made a bad mistake. Oprah. Jesus can't possibly be the only way to God. You, you know, only the prayers of the saints keep you alive. Because I'm going to tell you something about God the Father. He is very peculiar about Jesus Christ, the Son. You don't want to be fooling around with Jesus Christ, the Son. Because he butchered him to save us. And then you just spit in his face and just talk about him any kind of way. You don't want to be fooling around with Jesus. The Holy Ghost shines light on Jesus. The Holy Ghost is the lamp. Jesus Christ is the showbread. He illuminates Jesus. The Holy Ghost never draws attention to himself. He only illuminates Jesus. Jesus is the central focus of the universe. I don't want to be fooling around with Jesus. I don't want to pay him any kind of, you know, any kind of uh, uh, disrespect. I don't want him not liking me. Look, the Bible says kiss the son. Kiss the son. You better kiss the Lord Jesus Christ on his cheek and say, I'll bow, I'll humbly bow before you. To stay free and out of this hell that's coming on this planet. But your best bet is to remain very sober and serious minded and seek for power. Now what do we have in front of us? We have the carnal mind and the flesh in covenant with the demons. I told you God's remedy for the carnal mind and the flesh is the cross. You crucify flesh. You cast out demons. Any church that doesn't do those two things, the word priest should be crucifying you. That's the goal of the word, to kill you. But then you have to have the power to cast out the demons in covenant with the flesh. You kill flesh, you cast out demons. You kill flesh, you cast out demons. You kill flesh, you cast out demons. You'll be renovating the person. They'll be changing. That's how it works. Can Christians have a demon? They can have hundreds of them. Because they came in from a nasty, filthy world. They didn't come in clean and pristine. You clean fish after you catch fish. Trying to live in a make-believe world like you don't have any demons. That's what's plaguing you. You religiously ascended mentally to God, but you didn't get free. Now you're trying to pretend like you're free. Caught in that religious matrix. Trying to look free, act free, talk free. Say the right code words. Bless Abundantly blessed. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. They get in, give, give announcements at church. Well, amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, amen. Uh, we're going on today. We're going to amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, have a uh, church, uh, church social. Amen. Praise the Lord. And pray the Lord. Amen. And uh, amen. Uh, what is wrong with you? Nobody talks like that. Nobody starts the sinners off on today. Come on, man. What? what? Why are you talking like this? Miss Peterson, you're a, you're a teacher, an elementary school teacher. You don't talk like this in, in class on today. Why are you doing it here? Well, it's church. I have to change over to church talk for people to understand me here. Ending every sentence with amen. All that's, all that's spiritual. That's spiritual stuff going on. When a preacher starts tuning up and acting crazy and uh, and uh, uh, that's a, that's a demon. That's a demon. Matter you looking at a demon manifest in church live and in person, and you sit there swaying to it. Oh yeah, that's the spirit. The spirit. It's a spirit being divined on that demon in you, and the corresponding demon in you is responding to the divination of the pulpit when he starts tuning up. 
That's why you start getting lifted up to a stupor and start jumping up and the women start shouting. Because he pulled that demon out of the hat. He did the same thing a pipe player does in India with a snake in a basket. He just played the music of the pipe. It's sing songy. And the demon inside you start swaying. That's why your body starts swaying. You ever seen women rocking in church? They'll start rocking first. You don't believe it? Listen to me right now on live stream. Go to church on Sunday and watch it happen. Stat, sit in the back of the church this time. And watch the women start rocking when he start that sing song you preach. That's the demon being stirred up. Then after a while they're going to jump up and start shouting. Because the demon came to a fever pitch. And everybody thinking they caught the Holy Ghost. You call it a ghost, but it wasn't holy. Go to www.omegaministry.org and listen to the ministry tape. You got a ghost, but he ain't holy. That's what happened to you. You caught the ghost, but it wasn't the Holy Ghost. It was the demon divined on you through that crazy preacher that you yielded your members to. Whatever you yield yourself to, the Bible says, brings you into captivity and makes you a slave. We got to see God for power. But it's got to be sought outside the matrix. Killing the flesh, mortifying the carnal mind, and then casting out the demons that yoke us to this world. You can't drink in from their cisterns, the cisterns of the demons, and kill the flesh. Because the very drinking in from the demons is stimulating the flesh to live. That's what they're here for. All we got to do is make a strong will Iron cast decision. I am crossing the Jordan River. That's what you got to do. You got to make it iron cast. I'm going across this river with a sober mind. And I'm going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm coming back in the power of the Spirit to set captives free. And I will not be denied. That's what it's all about. Outside of that, all you got left on Sunday and Wednesday night is another pep rally and you and I know we can't take any more of those let's stand and we'll pray y'all pray in the new year 1245 by way of the internet join us stand where you are and pray with us as we pray in the new year I'll remain seated since I'm, I'm on the screen so you can see me but we're going to pray just to move on to another place in God. It's time to move on to another place in the Lord. It's, it's this right here. It's like a creek bed that's dried up. Like an Elijah's day sitting by that river. That creek rather. Kishon I think it was he was sitting by. And it just dried up. And that's what's happened down here. It's dried up. Religion is, is gone as far as it can. And you're ready to go to another place now. And that other place has to be in the Holy Ghost, full of power, to do the job yourself. I was talking to a brother yesterday. He was asking me about different situations, different ministries. I said, look, man, just get full of the Holy Ghost and do the job yourself. Don't worry about what the rest of them doing. Why don't you just do it yourself? This is a do-it-yourself gospel. You get filled and go do it. You don't deserve other people. Go do it. You can't find anything wrong with me and, 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 and try to berate me and put me down. Go do it yourself. Price, I don't believe this, what you're saying. Well, go do it yourself. It's infallible. If you have anything to say about anybody doing something wrong, just go do it yourself. You get filled and do the job. That's what salvation is really all about. Father, right now, we thank you for your presence and the fact that the word of God is true. And God, we thank you that you are now changing our minds to understand the word of God by revelation to walk in the spirit, not to fulfill the lust of the flesh. This thing is not for people, God, that are just living a life based on information and going to school and seminaries and getting that doctrine and data and dogma and debates bathed into the systems. But this is for somebody that wants to actually experience God. The Bible says that the gospel is experiential. Walk in the spirit, not to fulfill the lust of the flesh. As men are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Bible says, Jesus, that you said you'd come and you and your father would come and make your abode in us. You live in us. 
This thing is about Christ in us, the hope of glory. Crucified with Christ and letting Christ live. No longer I that live it, but Christ is living within me. This thing is about a force, a power, a supernatural visitation that comes from the spirit world through a portal opened up by the blood of the Lamb. Even in witchcraft, blood sacrifice is necessary to open up gateways to the spirit world. The blood of Jesus Christ has opened up a gateway for the Holy Ghost to come upon us. It's a spiritual portal to be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost of God to do the works. God, no more church anity, no more religion, no more pep rallies, no more being worked up, no more carnal expectations, no more excitement and pleasure and entertainment. We live a life led by the Spirit, and the Spirit gives us R&R. &R. You give us recreation. You give us times of refreshing. But God, we're not down here to just live a life of pleasure, a life of just seeking entertainment. We're here to do a job. This is a military assignment. You have an enemy down here, an adversary. That must be overcome and destroyed. Yes. The Bible says Jesus for this purpose you were manifested in the flesh. To destroy the works of the devil. Yes. These people down here have been brought to the brink of insanity. Which also entails they've been brought to the edge of where they can be saved. They've been driven. I mean who can listen to this kind of music all day. All day. God, I remember we used to do music in the world. At, at the end of us doing the records at a dance or at some kind of a, 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 an occasion, a wedding or a party, man, every guy that was involved with doing that music would get back in that van and say, man, don't turn on no music. Don't cut on nothing. I don't want to hear nothing. Because you listen to that stuff for four or five hours, six hours, and your mind was exhausted from hearing music and noise. And these people listen to this stuff all day. The most filthy, the most debased, the most degraded, the most inhumane filth ever generated from the mind of anybody. And you bathe in it all day until you're driven into madness. They got to stay on drugs. They got to keep drinking liquor. They got to keep popping, pee, popping pills, methamphetamines and and all kinds of molly and, 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 and lean and all this stuff they're drinking just to try to cope with everyday existence because they're being driven into madness. You can't stay on the strip of pole all night and walk away from the strip joint sane. You walk away driven into madness. You've been butt naked in a room of 500 guys all night. Something happened to you. You're not the same person that you were. Something has entered you, God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we end this three-day fast, yes. we ask for a visitation to come upon us. We ask for you to come personally, as God, to see everybody here, yes. everybody on live stream, yes. everybody that's going to hear this message yes. of visitation to come by their house to see them personally. Jesus. Come to the tabernacle they live in, a yes. physical visitation. Drive out the demonic entities and God backfill with the presence of Almighty God. Just like the gathering demoniac to find them sitting, clothed, and in the right mind. If we look at it, to be sitting down with your clothes on in your right mind. That says a lot. Not running around down here. Not naked and crazy in your right mind. That tells me folks that's running around, no clothes on, are reflecting the fact that they're insane. Insanity has come to the human race. God and only a divine intervention can save us. We pray for every family represented here, all these children, all these people have gone astray. God, go after them. Go after them and break the yoke from off of their necks. The Bible says the yoke shall be taken from off of your neck because of the anointing. We can dispatch the Holy Ghost through our words. Our words do not fall through the, to the ground. We pray the prayer of faith in Jesus' name.
in Jesus' name, yes, dispatch the power of the Holy Ghost yes, to break the yes, yoke. Break the yoke. Yes, Lord. Break it, Father. The yoke to the world. Yes, the Lord. yoke to people. Break Soul ties. Yes, Lord. Break that yoke. Break in Jesus name. Jesus, yoke yes. friends, in Jesus' name. Yoke to friends. Young boys, yoke to whores. Yes, Lord. Young girls, yoke to whoremongers yes, and pimps. Lord God. In Jesus' name. Young people, yoke to yes, drug Lord. pushers. Yes, the, the drug yes. pusher got a yoke on their neck. Yes, Lord. That appetite for drugs, that addiction is a yoke. Break that yoke in Jesus' name. Jesus. The Bible says you send your word and heal. Them. The Bible says there is balm in Gilead. God. Look at the situation. Look at the dire need. Look at the pitiful state of these people. God break the yoke. Mothers and fathers living in that Jezebel Ahab hell. Break that yoke of that Jezebel spirit. Break the yoke of the Ahab spirit. Break the yoke of fornication. Break the yoke of adultery. Break the yoke of homosexuality. Break the yoke of lesbianism. Break the yoke of oral and anal sex. Break the yoke of bestiality. Break the yoke of pedophilia. Break the yoke of witchcraft and sorcery. Break the yoke of spell casting. Break the yoke of seances. Break the yoke. Break the yoke. The anointing breaks the yoke. Jesus name. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Not another year of this, God. Break the yoke. Detach the church from the world and the atmosphere and let it reestablish itself in the spirit. A spiritual essence, a spiritual entity enveloping the church that we walk in the power of the spirit. You came back, Jesus, from a fast, 40 days, 40 nights, in the power of the Spirit. It's the power of the Spirit. You told your disciples, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. To be a witness. To be a witness. God, that's what it's all about. A witness bathed in power. Martyrdom bathed in power, dead to the world, crucified, bathed in power. Can't go anymore. Can't go any further. This has run its course. It's run out of steam. There's no further to take it. Madness is the only thing left for the human race. The culture, the arts, the music tell us madness is on the horizon. What new CD can Nicki Minaj make really? Mm. Kim Kardashian is stripped down bare butt naked. Where what's next? Well, what how further can you take it other than being bare butt naked? See, it's reached the climax, it's reached the end of the road. It's taken as as, as much as it can take, it's gone as far as it can go. They've reached the lowest levels of depravity. God, if there be any mercy or grace in heaven, if there be, if there be any faithfulness, if there, if there be any favor shown to Jesus Christ the Son because of the sacrificial work done on the cross, butchered like an animal for mankind, pour out the power of the Holy Ghost in response to the sacrifice, not for our sakes, but for Jesus' sake. Pour out the power of the Spirit in response to the Son's sacrifice. He laid down his life. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Pour out the power. To give respect to the son's sacrifice. Pour out the power. Pour out the power. Pour out the power. power. Respond to these prayers. By way of live stream, move through these internet channels and touch these people's lives. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Now, by way of live stream, and here we'll close by this prayer. Pray after me, Father. 
in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I renounce, I renounce this world, this world and, every ruling demon power and every ruling demon power that has control of it. That has control of it. Any, spiritual force any spiritual force that has taken up residence, taken up residence in, my soul, in my soul, my mind, my, mind, my, emotions, my emotions, my feelings, my, feelings, my, desires, my desires, my thoughts. Thoughts, inclinations, inclinations, any area, any area of, my soul, of my soul contaminated, contaminated by, these by these demons. I ask you, God, I ask you God, to cleanse me now, to cleanse me now and, flush out and flush out these hidden entities. These hidden entities. Every demon, embedded, Every demon embedded in a place of my subconscious mind. In a place of my subconscious Burrowed in, burrowed in to different organs, to different organs sexual organs, sexual the, organs eyes, the eyes, the hands, hands every, organ every organ where you're housed. Where you're housed. I'm, asking you, God, I'm asking you, God, to flush out, to flush out those, demonic those demonic entities and cleanse me from any damage done. Infirmities, pains, pains, any kind of crippling effects, any kind of crippling effects dysfunctions, dysfunctions, anything, anything that's, been that's been done to any organ in my body by demons, restore those organs, restore those organs to, normal. to normal in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Demons, demons that have come to my children, that have come to my children and, taken and taken their minds over. I stand against you I now. And I curse you, and I curse you in, the in the spirit world. God, send your word. God, send your word. Destroy, the yoke Destroy the yoke of those demons, of those demons. off of my children. Of my children. In, Jesus name. in Jesus' name. You that forecast witchcraft, you that forecast witchcraft. Against, my child. against my child, I reverse that curse. I reverse that curse. Let the wiles of the devil, Let the wiles of the devil come, upon the come upon the forecaster of his power. Of his power. I, reverse you. I reverse you. Every curse, every, curse. every, incantation. every incantation, every controlling word, every controlling word. Sexual, power. sexual power that's locked up my child. That's I curse you in Jesus' name. And I take the keys of the kingdom. And I unlock that door that you've tried to hide my child behind. And I command them like Lazarus to come forth out of that grave. In Jesus' name. I dispatch angels, I dispatch angels and, I call forth the power of the Most High God and I call forth the power of the Most High God to destroy, to destroy these demonic entities. These demonic entities. In, Jesus name, In Jesus' name, I have the authority. I exercise that authority verbally right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. God. God. Deliver us from evil, us from evil. For, your glory and for your glory and for your honor that Jesus Christ might be glorified. And, Jesus Christ might be glorified. and it's in Jesus' name I pray. And it's in Jesus name I pray. Amen. Amen. Right Amen. now, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over all demonic elements Amen. that have somehow embedded themselves here in these people and any sibling. Mothers, fathers, anybody in their family where demons have taken up a stronghold. Any divined up spirits coming through people that have covenants cut with kids, family members, and friends. I command you demons that are bringing torment to minds and souls and spirits and causing all kinds of disorder to go right now in Jesus' name. I command you to go in Jesus' name. That unseen hand of the demonic world that reaches out to bind a human being. That unseen demonic power. I curse you in Jesus' name. The power of witchcraft. 
I break the power. Break it, Lord. Break it, Lord. Break that soul attack. Yes, Lord. Break that hold on the spirit of the soul. Yes, Jesus. Break it, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. By way of internet, I pray for those that are over the internet, God, send your word and your power, yes. anything binding them, loose them from it. Yes. It's time to be free. Yes. It's time to see the power of God on display. Yes. Raise up the church in these last and evil days for your glory and for your honor. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to remind you, conference coming May 27th through the 25th here in Atlanta. Atlanta Renaissance Hotel, all the registration information available at our website, www.omegaministry.org. You can register there now. Everything's up and running. Everything is available. Also be reminded that fees for registration, the amounts are there based on providing food for you for three days. So you don't have to worry about eating. That's all uh, uh, concerning your meals and making sure you eat every day. So it's not just in money we collect health to scale to try to make a profit. It's about feeding everybody. So you'll start come you'll come in Friday eating, you'll eat Saturday, you'll eat Sunday, all through the conference, the food is provided. We got a hospitality uh, suite always available to go and snack in and, and play games and have a little fellowship time. So you'll always be fed. You don't have to worry about food. So that's the expense that's knocked down and taken away from registration fees. So uh, make sure you get registered. Sooner the better. Make your transportation arrangements and be here May, May 22nd through the 25th 
for the Army of God conference. Remember, Dunamis Tabernacle supported. Give to the to the program. If you're listening to this tape, stop what you're doing while you're listening and contribute. We're trying to get the church up and running this month into February and get it on the ground, put boots on the ground and do the job. This is a war. It's a hands-on war. Last time, uh, last thing I'll say, remember the prayer line. Every night, 1-805-399-1000, access code 409-367. 1-805-399-1000, access code 409-367. It's a new year. January the 1st is upon us. It's time to do a new thing. It's time to move on to higher ground. See you back here Sunday. Have a, uh, a blessed fellowship time tonight and just stay in prayer and fasting to get out of this world. Stay out of the world and for whatever you do, stay out of the matrix.